this uh, webinar. You are most welcome. And uh, I hope we can have an interesting uh, day where we address the different necessary social and ecological paths to peace and where we have a very wide range of speakers. Interestingly, most of them from Central and Eastern Europe. 10 out of 15 speakers are from Central and Eastern Europe. And some of them we see already have uh, now joining us. Uh, <clears throat> the first part of the program you see in uh, the chat, uh, starting with the Universal Disarmament for Socio-Ecological Transition, moderated by Leo Gabriel. And then we will have Stop Repression in East and the West. And uh, after lunch, we will make an hour lunch. We will have the issue of the climate movements and its social and peace challenges, followed by the social struggles and uh, the ecological and peace challenges. And finally, addressing the issue, what's next? And uh, it, we have some invited speakers, but I am for sure that many of us also uh, have a lot of uh, things coming up, including World Social Forum in Nepal. Uh, so this is the schedule for today. Uh, in the chat, you can also download the whole webinar, if you know how you do, there is a sort of different ways of it in different uh, <clears throat> Zoom programs. But in my program, it's a uh, pile downwards and then I get it uh, activated. But we will inform also uh, during the webinar in the chat about the following uh, sessions. Uh, now, I do hope that my name is Tord Björk. Uh, I'm active in the Friends of the Earth Sweden and also a member of the Council of International Peace Bureau, as well as the International Council of World Social Forum. Uh, and uh, I hope Leo Gabriel is back now. He went to take his coffee but he's supposed to be uh, hosting this first session. But I see, oh yeah, thank you, Leo. So now it's your turn to continue. I just informed in general about the webinar in its totality, the webinar for social and ecological paths for peace. Yes, good morning, good morning, good morning uh, from Vienna, Austria. You know, Austria is sort of a hybrid country between East and West and North and South. Uh, and that uh, gives me the opportunity to talk about uh, how uh, this webinar, what are the roots and also the, the sense of this webinar. Uh, on the one hand, uh, the most immediate was uh, our conference in Vienna uh, on June 10th and 11th, uh, where we managed to get uh, especially peace movement, but also other movements uh, from different parts of the world, where it also was clear that uh, the countries of the Global South, uh, uh, in their leadership, are mostly very much pressing to stop the war in uh, Ukraine by negotiations and ceasefire. Um, and uh, at the end, uh, we uh, issued a call for the first week of, of, of October, which we are now, to make a general mobilization uh, of different kinds. Uh, some do demonstrations, some do webinars like this one and others uh, have other means of uh, spreading spreading the world around. On the other hand, uh, the other route uh, was a little bit more back. Uh, in January, uh, uh, 
2021, we had in the world a, 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 a virtual and online uh, social forum where, of course, also uh, the uh, piece was highlighted, uh, not only uh, thinking about Ukraine, but of the worldwide armament structures, uh, which developed in tremendous speed. And uh, uh, we came to the conclusion at that time that uh, uh, we have to get together uh, social movements, environmental movements, human rights movement, women's movement, and so on, to, uh, uh, to, to, to increase, to broaden uh, the platform for peace. Uh, because, uh, and it was uh, at that time already very visible that uh, uh, peace is in somehow the center uh, peace uh, is uh, on the one hand without peace you have uh, no democracy you don't have any social justice uh, you don't have uh, a, a protection of environment and so on so uh, the idea was to put forward a sort of a convergence of the different movements under a common roof still to be discussed because uh, this convergence that we were clear out of our experiences couldn't be in the form of a top-down uh, new international or something like that. Uh, neither, uh, let's say, a, a, an ideological platform where everybody agrees uh, from the beginning to the end, but it is a discussion process. And uh, here we are uh, following this idea of a discussion process on the grounds of other discussion processes where uh, to start with, uh, uh, we had a sort of a common agreement on the following uh, um, requirement on the, on, the, on the following goal, which is called a universal disarmament for social and environmental transition, for social justice and environment uh, transition, which means we should bind together uh not as a as a center yeah. of uh that the peace movement has to be always in the center but to to take take up the issue in the context of different movements and that is reflected by the program we have here uh i asked uh, the our friend sean connor uh who is uh, the uh, uh, director or president uh, of the International Peace Bureau, of one of the biggest peace movements in the world, uh, who has been very active in staging the conference in Vienna, and uh, perhaps uh, Sean you could explicit a little bit more uh, what it is uh, uh, in this action-oriented perspective which should bring us together. Sean. Thank you, Leo. Uh, and yes, I'm, I'm the executive director of the International Peace Bureau um, at the moment. For those of you perhaps a little bit less familiar with the work of the International Peace Bureau, uh, we are a 130-year-old organization. Uh, we are an umbrella of peace organizations and activists and peace-related organizations from around the world. So uh, this also includes a lot of the peace-adjacent fields, including, of course, social justice, uh, organizations working on the environment and beyond, 
because, of course, this is all closely tied to how we understand peace. Um, as Leo had correctly mentioned, uh, we were one of the, the principal organizers of the International Summit for Peace in Ukraine that was held in Vienna on the 10th and 11th of June. Um, and now we are uh, near the end of our week of action uh, that was a proposal that came out of that summit uh, that took place starting on 30th of September and runs through tomorrow, the 8th of October. Uh, during this week, we've had actions in over, I think, 20, 25 countries around the world. Um, perhaps there's some that also we aren't aware of there. Um, I will, after my speech, try to post in the chat the link that we have to all of those events uh, so you can see also the, the great picture that we have of everyone who is mobilizing. Uh, the summit in Vienna was really a, a unique opportunity to bring peace activists and those concerned about the situation in Ukraine together to have difficult conversations. We do understand, uh, even within the peace movement and others, there are different perspectives and different views on the war in Ukraine and how we can lead to peace in uh, in the Ukraine in, in the current situation. So uh, it was it was a good opportunity to have those difficult conversations and to come out finding the points where we can all agree, but also understanding where we have differences, perhaps different approaches together can still work together in the longer run for peace. Uh, so you know, with that in mind, we now have our week of action and we are seeing uh, a lot of movements. Also, a lot has changed since June. Um, and so IPB also last weekend held a webinar of our own as part of the week of action in which we looked at what has changed uh, in these few months since June, uh, both on the ground in Ukraine in the geopolitical context of the war and within the peace movement, including areas where we need to put our focus, uh, such as defending conscientious objectors. And I think some of the other speakers later will go more into depth in that topic. Uh, beyond that, I did want to uh, also address one particular approach that IPV is using in our work in Ukraine, but also much more widely uh, in all of our work to create a more peaceful world. Uh, and to bring in an introduction, uh, introduction to that, I'll first provide just some basic facts uh, leading into then the answer that we are proposing, or one possible answer that we are proposing. Uh, so first to say we uh, received a report to our office from the Autonomous University of Barcelona, the School for a Culture of Peace. It's a report on conflict and peace building in 2022. And uh, in its summary, you know, there are many different reports that have different styles for this, uh, but they reported 33 armed conflicts in the world in 2022 and 108 socio-political crises, many of which have violent components to them or potential for escalation to the point of armed conflict. So we are living in a very dangerous situation. There is a lot going on in the world. Uh, Ukraine, of course, is a hot point at the moment, but we also need to look more generally at all of the conflicts happening around the world. And this is one of the missions of the International Peace Bureau. We can also look at uh, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute's data on military spending in 2022. The total in that year was 2.24 trillion U.S. dollars, a 3.7 percent increase from 2021. And of course, we need to note that NATO countries alone, which are 30 countries, made up 55% of all that military spending, or 1.232 trillion. The arms industry is also raking in record profits during these moments. Uh, in 2022, the British arms exports doubled from the previous year to a record 8.5 billion pounds. The US spent 20 billion US dollars on arming Ukraine alone in 2022. And of course, these uh, arms industry uh, are also sending arms to pretty much every active conflict zone that we have at the moment. We also have data from the scientists for global responsibility and the conflict and environment observatory uh, that are estimating the greenhouse gas emissions by the militaries. This includes bases and military personnel, supply chain of the military, and military exercises, drills, and equipments, but does not include other environmental effects that we also should look at, such as the destruction of war in, in war times, uh, environments, uh, environmental destruction, fires, chemicals such as polyfluoroalkyl substances, or PFAS, 
uh, and damage to infrastructure and the greenhouse gas emissions for reconstruction efforts that come afterwards. Uh, it's hard to estimate exact amounts because a lot of this data is not reported publicly, uh, and this has been the case since the 1997 Kyoto Protocol, uh, where countries have no obligations to report much of this data. Uh, but based on the estimates that these organizations were able to put together, militaries around the world contribute 5.5% of global greenhouse gas emissions, and while that number alone may not seem like much, it is is a significant amount, and they, uh, they uh, through this report, created a, a comparison that if the world's militaries combined were a country of its own, they would be the fourth largest national carbon footprint, more than the entire country of Russia. We also have the Climate Collateral Report from 2022 that was put together by the Transnational Institute, Tipping Point North-South, and Stop Wappenhandel, uh, which claims that the richest countries, uh, known as the Annex 2 in the UN climate talks, are spending 30 times as much on their armed forces as they spend on climate financing. And seven out of the 10 historical emitters of greenhouse gases are also among the top 10 global military spenders. So this creates an extremely concerning picture. We can also bring the sustainable development goals into this. We had just uh, last month the SDG summit in 2023 of the UN. Uh, General Secretary Antonio Guterres claimed that the SDGs need a global rescue plan and that currently 25 countries of the global south dedicate more than 20% of their national income to servicing debts, preventing them from being able to invest in sustainable development. So we see as it currently stands that between 3.3 and $4.5 trillion per year, more than the total global military spending per year, needs to be mobilized in order to achieve the Agenda for Sustainable Development for 2030. So there is an urgent case to make changes to how we prioritize our own security on this planet. Uh, the issues that we're facing at the moment are global. They are not national. Of course, there are national uh, issues as well, but many of these can be addressed by addressing the social injustices and inequalities on a global stage. Our approach to addressing this is common security. Uh, we, Many of you may be familiar with the 1980s original common security report by the Palma Commission. The International Peace Bureau, alongside the, uh, uh, the International Trade Union Confederation and the Olaf Palma Center in Sweden, worked last year to create a modern common security report for the 21st century. And I'll also post a link to that in the chat. Um, but just to give you a basic summary of what is included in there, uh, we have uh, six basic principles that all people have the right to human security, freedom from fear and freedom from want, that building trust between nations and peoples is fundamental to peaceful and sustainable human existence, that there can be no common security without nuclear disarmament and strong limitations on conventional weapons and reduced military expenditure, that global and regional cooperation and multilateralism and the rule of law are crucial to tackling many of the world's challenges, that dialogue, conflict prevention, and confidence building measures must replace aggression and military force as the means of resolving disputes, and that better regulation, international law, and responsible government, governance excuse me, are also needed uh, to extend, uh, to cover new military technologies, such as the realms of cyberspace, outer space, and artificial intelligence. Uh, the, the approach does not include everything that we need. I'll just wrap up here, Leo. Uh, it does not include everything we need for a peaceful world, but it is an important starting point, and we need to redefine how we think about security when we're facing such risks to our planetary health, the environment, and uh, inequality on a global stage. And yeah. we argue that the need for a new security is the most important thing that we can contribute at this point from our international network. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean, uh, for this very rich in information yeah. intervention, uh, probably in order to digest all these figures, uh, we have to listen to it again uh, afterwards uh, and uh, in order to get all these notes. N now, after having put, let's say, the general panorama and the intention of uh, this web webinar, uh, we are 
should move to uh, Eastern European countries, struggles, uh, what is going on there on the grounds of an analysis of uh, the different conflicts which are uh, unfortunately costing so many, many, many lives. And uh, I would like to uh, take up the moderation uh, uh, to Igor Gottlieb, uh, who is a, a, a Russian scientist activist from St. Petersburg, and uh, to introduce our guests from Eastern Europe. Mm, uh, excuse me, Leo, uh, should I now introduce uh, other speakers from Eastern Europe? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Um, actually, it's me and it's Aram Amirbekan from Yerevan, Armenia. Mm, we uh, supposed that uh, also uh, Ukrainian activist will participate, uh, but uh, he uh, has written me that uh, he isn't able to participate. So actually, uh, the two uh, speakers uh, planned, uh, scheduled for this slot are me and Aram. Uh, but uh, as far as I can understand, there will be also the second slot when uh, Yuri Shulzhenko, uh, pacifist uh, activist from uh, Kyiv, will speak, where uh, Aksana Chelysheva uh, will speak, uh, who is a political emigre from Russia, uh, who is uh, very much involved in different uh, situations concerning those who are persecuted both in the East and in the West. And also Alexei Sakhnin, who is a Russian political emigre too, who is living now in France as far as I know. And uh, these uh, uh, topics concerning the political repression of the East and West will be discussed in the second slot. Yes. Well, let's uh let's start with the intervention of uh you two and uh, this if uh, there is uh, the other friend who did not show up it gives us more time for discussion afterwards mm -hmm, uh -huh, good morning all uh i would uh, speak um mostly about things concerning the former, the former Soviet Union conflicts. And I start, uh, start from the tragic events in Nagorno-Karabakh because they have consequences beyond the South Caucasus area. And these uh, consequences should be taken seriously because the Azerbaijani action in Nagorno-Karabakh when it was... Uh, Reconquered and its Armenian population has uh, uh, run from this area to Armenia. Uh, this inspires those who seek one sided militaristic solutions in other armed conflicts, including, of course, the Ukrainian war, the pro Russian camp, as well as pro, the pro Ukrainian one. Uh, actually, both pro Russian and pro Ukrainian voices are split among themselves in their sympathies in the Armenia Azerbaijan conflict. Nevertheless, many of them on both sides are now saying openly that the Azerbaijani action is a good example of how such conflicts should be solved, not by freezing or maintaining them in a hanged state, but by some decisive blow. And for, for pro-Ukrainian hawks, the so-called liberation of Karabakh by Baku is a prototype for would-be so-called liberation of Donbass and Crimea by Kyiv, they dream about, in the name of uh, so-called international law. Uh, and they see that nobody cares among the big actors when uh, almost all Armenian inhabitants of Nagorno karabakh are fleeing to Armenia, as they do not want uh, so-called integration uh, that would be repressive and humiliating under the Azerbaijani regime. And uh, in Donetsk, Luhansk, Simferopol, uh, not the whole population, but only a significant part would flee after a hypothetical Ukrainian takeover. 
so it would be even easier to digest in the world. And we saw a similar story in the 90s in Croatia. Many Ukrainian hawks uh, have expressed after 2014 their sympathies to a Croatian solution for Donbass. On the other side, many Putinists take uh, this Azerbaijan's iron fist actions as an example for Russia and its political and military affairs, particularly in Ukraine. They uh, also interpret uh, the betrayal of Karabakh Armenians by Russia and Russian so-called peacekeepers uh, who haven't helped them in any way during the last events as some kind of a deserved punishment of Armenia because its leadership tried to some degree to reorient uh, itself towards the West. And the real message of such propaganda is that Russia as a big imperialist player is authorized to pursue its superpower interests as it sees fit, disregarding any interests of junior partners and its own commitments. Of course, uh, Western and other big players uh, don't differ from Russia much in this respect. And the first thing that all this uh, reminds us about is that pure pacifism doesn't work. These solutions must be supported by force, including military levers, of course in a responsible way, to prevent a new or renewed war, especially at early stages of a peace transition. When we look now at the Ukrainian war, we see that it has become a war of attrition, with both sides hoping to see the enemy's collapse due to exhausted resources or internal demoralization, disintegration. Uh, but nobody can say when such collapse can happen. Black swans uh, are unpredictable, and if we simply extrapolate the current parameters of the situation into the future, we see that at least one key component of the military potential, human resources for mobilization, is lastly likely to be exhausted in Ukraine much sooner than in Russia. Uh, so... Uh, in this situation, this, the option of negotiation and ceasefire promoted by the peace movement gets a chance, but uh, it should be defended in good faith, and this means that we have uh, should have a proper understanding what does it mean in reality. Recently, I saw an interesting article by Mikhail Bri and Hans Birbaum, The Left and the Inter-Imperial War, from August. Uh, the authors admit uh, some important things. Uh, one of them is that the ceasefire would not yet be a real peace. It will be only better than war. Uh, a possible immediate outcome is only an armistice, what is called the Korean option, because Russia doesn't abandon its territorial claims to the areas it has reconquered, so-called new regions. Ukraine doesn't agree to give up on those areas, uh, this looks outright impossible, and uh, the Russian abandoning of these uh, of these conquered territories would require radical political changes in Moscow. While the proportions of neg negotiations and ceasefire now doesn't assume such changes, uh, so Brian Birbaum uh, admit that uh, a frozen conflict will have to be endured for a very long period of time. And they propose that such a state of affairs, a ceasefire, but with no war and no peace, actually, should be controlled by uh, the third side, by the United Nations and neutral states. This implies a military control. This is a very important thing. To make it closer to realization, a great effort is really needed, not only in words, uh, but the, these uh, neutral states should really engage it. First of all, we are talking about the global south countries. Now they are for peace, but uh, pushing their own interests, they uh, aren't ready for more direct involvement in Ukraine, beyond simply a diplomatic talk. Um, I, as far as I know, in a few weeks, uh, a new gathering on the possibilities of peace in Ukraine is planned in Turkey, with the participation of the Global South countries, maybe some action can be taken here. Uh, but there are some uh, other points, Brian Birbaum don't mention them. Uh, the first thing is that even if uh, such an engagement of the third side will be uh, achieved, uh, Russia and the West will remain the main actors. And uh, if the Korean option is realized, it will mean a deterrent political and military presence on both sides. And for Ukraine, I think this will mean uh, both uh, 
preserving Russian militarization of those areas that are controlled by Russia and the increased Western presence may very likely also direct military presence in Ukraine. Uh, this will be some Cold War-like containment, not uh, as an alternative to the hot war, no more. Uh, Moreover, the uh, analogy with Korea can be extended further to the internal characteristics of both states. We know that after 1953, the regime in the North Korea that was relatively moderate before the war transformed itself into a hardcore Stalinist dictatorship lasting up to now uh, with unclear prospects of evolution. While in the South, the right-wing authoritarianism was also strengthened and democratization took place only in the end of 80s. Uh, and if we take this analogy with the present situation, of course, the regime of uh, in Russia won't have North Korean characteristics. Russia is much larger, more diverse. But nevertheless, uh, the groups and individuals in Russia that are persecuted, include those, including those uh, persecuted for their anti-war position, they would themselves in a very hard situation with Koreanization of this kind. Uh, and uh, this is not uh, the only uh, bad thing concerning the current regime in Russia. Actually, I think that with the current regime and current leadership in Russia, no lasting settlement is possible. Yes, it is possible some freezing of the conflict, but it would be quite unstable. Just now it looks like the, like the regime, especially Putin personally, isn't even ready for this, as it is preparing the country for a prolonged war. But uh, I think that they can change their position and uh, the armistice can become reality. And uh, it would be a good thing uh, as an opportunity to wait with less deaths till the serious changes of the situation, first of all, in Russia. Uh, but uh, uh, anyway, it wouldn't be a step to a common security system sought by many, including uh, Brian Birbaum and Sean Connor also has told about us about this. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, this wouldn't uh, be... Uh, connected with some stopping arms supplies to Ukraine because the militarization will continue. Only after significant changes in uh, of Russian regime, and I think that this must include uh, removal of Putin of some kind, he, of course he isn't eternal, uh, a real peace settlement uh, will be possible. Now we can have only some intermediate uh, partial solutions, so-called. And uh, here, there, I think that a conclusion is that those in the civil society uh, who really want a lasting settlement in Ukraine, including, of course, this universal disarmament, the demilitarization on both sides, they shouldn't associate themselves politically with the Putin regime in any way. Uh, the uh, of course, this, uh, the changes in Russia will happen primarily due to internal development, uh, the idea of anti-Russian hawks that uh, some Ukrainian military successes will um, provoke uh, changes for the better in Russia, I think they, uh, I disagree with them strongly. Uh, this will happen primarily due to internal developments, but uh, peace, the peace movement should at least help those who oppose the regime in Russia, including those who are persecuted, who are in jail, uh, not only well-known persons, not only uh, quiet, non-violent, not only non-violent protesters, but all those who didn't commit violence against civilians. Here, uh, I think that some help to the victims of political repression in Russia will uh, come from the peace movement, as I think uh, will be discussed uh, in our second slot. Thank you for the attention. Leo, you are muted. Thank you, Igor, uh, for for this statement, which will, of course, be, uh, and I see already in the chat, uh, somehow uh, leading to discussion, which we are making afterwards. But uh, please, now, the, uh, uh, the friend from... Uh, Armenia should take the floor.
Aram, please unmute. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope everyone can see and hear me. My name is Aram, a journalist based in Yerevan, Armenia. And I will try to give everyone a little bit of context about uh, the situation in Nagorno-Karabakh, what's been happening in the past three years after the 2020 war and its impact on global geopolitics in general. So um, to give you a little context, it seems like after 35 years of rivalry and wars and escalations, the conflict seems to be coming to an end, at least on an official level. The Nagorno-Karabakh Republic will officially be dissolved by the end of the year. Um, the army of that republic uh, has surrendered its weapons to Azerbaijan. And what's the most important, I think, is that almost the entire population of Nagorno-Karabakh, the vast majority of them being ethnic Armenians, have uh, refused to leave under Azerbaijani regime and uh, fled to Armenia. And uh, I should also mention that the, the escalation uh, in September this year, just a couple of weeks ago, followed nine months of blockade uh, uh, of Nagorno-Karabakh, which created disastrous humanitarian situations. And some people uh, even died of malnutrition. And uh, there also have been several escalations on the Armenian-Azerbaijani border itself since the 2020 war, with Armenian areas being occupied in 2021, with the excuse being the non-delimited border between the two countries. And of course, the, there were hundreds of casualties on both sides combined in 2022 in another escalation. So right now, the main uh, topic of discussion is the peace agreement that can potentially be signed in the upcoming months between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And what's also more discussed is who is going to be the mediator of that agreement. Because uh, with the Russian invasion in Ukraine um, and the West-East divide deepening even further, uh, the prospects of peace and demilitarization in the region are very much dependent on major, major geopolitical actors such as Russia, the EU, the US, Turkey, and Iran. Uh, so the peace is very much uh, mandated between, uh, mandated by major geopolitical powers rather than the populations of Armenia and Azerbaijan. And um, there's not a lot of enga engagement. I'll get to that later. But one thing that should also be noted is that the interstate transportation infrastructure systems, sorry, in South Caucasus that have been blockaded for 30 years because of this conflict are uh, such as railways and highways and also um, air connectivity are going to be potentially reopened after the peace agreement. And with the logistic, the major logistic issues connected to the Russian invasion in Ukraine. Um, for all of those geopolitical powers mentioned above, it's really important and crucial to have some kind of political and economic control uh, over those infrastructure systems, uh, which um, kind of uh, complicates the peace process even further. Um, forcing the parties uh, to somehow negotiate with everybody instead of negotiating with each other. Um, of course, in this context, there's a lot of disappointment in Armenia with Russia as for the, for the nation of Armenia and through a lot of like state propaganda in the past couple decades, Russia and CSTO have been uh, considered as the main ally of Armenia in this war. And this disappointment um, and shift of policies has been reflected in the actions of uh, both the civil society and even the Armenian government. There have been several reports about negotiations on military cooperation between Armenia and NATO member states, uh, specifically France, who has a military attaché now, and also uh, about a potential agreement with uh, between Armenia and France about the supply of weapons to Armenia. 
and uh, just a couple of weeks before the uh, last escalation, Armenia and the U.S. had a joint military exercise um, in Armenia. Um, I would also say that there is a significant effort in the civil society to uh, equate the liberal democracy that was established after the 2018 revolution in Armenia and Armenian sovereignty, Armenia's sovereignty at large to the westernization and uh, to the westernization of the country and to um, higher and, uh, you know, a, a stronger relations and ties with NATO and to present the West, the European Union, and uh, NATO as alternatives to Russian imperialism. So there is some uh, amount of critique of Russian imperialism with a lot of left-wing terminology borrowed from the left by the liberals and the civil society and the NGOs. But um, this critique of uh, imperialism ultimately comes down to suggestions about Armenia joining NATO, or Armenia having stronger ties with the EU, um, uh, basically, uh, you know, suggesting a switch between two empires. Um, so, unfortunately, uh, the discourse right now doesn't really revolve as much around the demilitarization and the critique of militarism and wars as it revolves around the remilitarization and westernization um, to somehow create this uh, Armenian forepost, probably, um, of NATO and the West. I'm also sorry to say that in, in a situation like this, there is objectively very little room to actual peace building and regional cooperation and generally, you know, uh, engagement initiatives between Armenians and Azerbaijanis, because uh, right now the uh, the peace that is being negotiated is not as much about the people's well-being and interests uh, as it is about the interests of states and corporations in South Caucasus and beyond. It should also be noted that when it comes to the arms industry and the militarization um, uh, trends in general, the use of Turkish and Israeli weaponry in the 2020 war uh, served very much as an ad campaign by showcasing the effectiveness of those weapons to murder people uh, and exacerbated the already militant trend uh, tendencies in the current uh, geopolitical world. And we can see the, the results uh, now in the high demand of various in various countries for Turkish and Israeli arms, and specifically the Turkish Bayraktar drones that were heavily used in 2020 and are now being used in Ukraine. Um, despite all of this... Um, I do believe that there are glimpses of hope. Uh, I should say that uh, there has been also a significant, uh, significant challenges around the ecological issues in South Caucasus because Armenia was blockaded from uh, blockaded by Turkey and Azerbaijan, and uh, a lot of the industries, such as my, such as the mining industry in this economy, um, were presented as um, not having an alternative. So I do believe that we potentially the opening of the borders, we can gradually say goodbye to the mining industry, which has been catastrophic for Armenia and for the region. There have also been major geopolitical, um, uh, major uh, regional challenges regarding the water resources between Armenia and Azerbaijan that could not really be resolved because there was no uh, uh, regional cooperation whatsoever between the two countries. And I do hope that this can change as well. But um, I would just like to say that right now that the peace being negotiated um, is not really one that is thinking militarism in Karabakh, but it is about just, um, you know, trying to 
reach a deal, you know, a, like a bunch of uh, geopolitical powers trying to reach a deal in in the region. Um, and of course, as Igor mentioned, the uh, the one sidedness. Uh, Of the of the created a myth that uh, one sided resolutions to the conflict can create um, better prospects in the future. Uh, whereas right now I can say that the the rivalry and the enmity between the uh, the Armenians and the Azerbaijanis have only has only been exacerbated by um, both Armenia dragging the status quo for um, starting a military offensive uh, which was pretty one-sided and uh, object like and objectively ultimately driving the entire population of Nagorno-Karabakh out uh, so I guess that's it for now and if anyone has any questions feel free to ask Thank you, Aram, uh, for this insight, uh, really, from the spot uh, of the problematic, which is much more complex than uh, the media is talking here about. Uh, now we have a, a, a space to... Uh, ask not only questions but also uh, discussions uh, about what the different uh, uh, intervenant have said. So please go ahead and lift uh, uh, under the button reaction your hands. I have, for instance, in the chat, there was uh, from Yuri Shilyatsenko a, uh, a point of view. Could you express that to all of us, Yuri? Uh, okay. Uh, hello. Um, uh, first of all, uh, I totally agree with uh, Igor Hotlib uh, that uh, uh, Putin's regime uh, is uh, 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 militarist and harmful and must be changed by uh, nonviolent means. Uh, 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 Igor said it must be changed, uh, but uh, uh, I uh, add by nonviolent means because it is important. You, you can't uh, achieve peace by violence, and this is my mistake uh, of uh, our President Zelensky. Uh, um, uh, so uh, uh, when Igor said that pacifism is not working, I must disagree with it because pacifism works. Uh, uh, it it worked uh, in Ukraine uh, in result of uh, uh, two nonviolent revolutions, uh, uh, which uh, uh, made our society uh, uh, more democratic, uh, though. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, democracy is still very fragile uh, and uh, oppressed uh, by militarist institutions. Uh, um, uh, as, as you know, I am uh, under repressions today and I will uh, discuss it a bit uh, in the next panel. Uh, uh, we we saw uh, how uh, after Russian invasion of Ukraine during this war of aggression, Ukrainians uh, gathered and stopped Russian tanks uh, by unarmed crowds. We see uh, amazing power of compassion uh, and humanitarian action, and it is unarmed protection of civilians. It is future. It is nonviolent resistance to aggression. Uh, and uh, uh, also uh, uh, remembering uh, events of 2014, uh, uh, when Russian aggression started uh, and uh, uh, Ukrainian army uh, 
uh, uh, started uh, to uh, uh, act very violently, uh, uh, even against uh, uh, not directly some limited Russian forces, but uh, uh, just against uh, protesters. Uh, uh, who uh, were not welcomed political changes. Uh, uh, of course, there was violent uh, uh, regime change uh, uh, in Kiev by pro-Western circles uh, with, uh, 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 unfortunately, right-wing sympathies. And uh, uh, in uh, uh, Donbass and in Crimea, uh, also by pro-Russian right-wingers. Uh, we, we know this uh, event uh, as uh, Revolution of Dignity and uh, Russian Spring. Um, uh, and uh, uh, people uh, in Donbass also resisted non-violently stopping Ukrainian tanks. So uh, both uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, people and uh, 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 I would say some uh, uh, Russians in Ukraine know uh, uh, effectiveness of nonviolent action. And uh, nonviolent action is future. Bloodshed uh, gives no hope for uh, world without war. Only uh, uh, nonviolent resistance uh, gives a hope that in the world where everybody refused to kill, there will be no wars. Thank you. Uh, for your contribution. Uh, uh, if there is nobody else who raised his hand, I have a question too, uh, specifically to Aram. Uh, being a social anthropologist uh, specialized in uh, indigenous people of Latin America, uh, uh, I want to ask you why uh, the question of autonomy, which has been discussed uh, in different contexts, also in the, com in, in the context of the Donbass, if you look at Minsk II uh, agreement at the time, uh, why this idea, not only of uh, independence of nation states, but uh, of the uh, uh, self-determination of uh, of people and peoples uh, in a different context did not prevail in this area uh, where it was so obvious that uh, uh, Karabakh should have a, its own space. Uh, why is so much sticking to the uh, priority of uh, Azerbaijan, uh, Turkey, and all these things on the one side and on the other side, immediately there comes into play NATO and so on. Isn't there, this is not only towards Karabakh, but uh, uh, I'm asking directly to Aram, why, why this idea did never come about or perhaps in the upcoming negotiations there could be Something like that. Aram. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Gabriel. Uh, this is a complicated question, um, but I'll try to keep it as uh, short and precise as possible. Um, so basically, uh, after the Armenian victory in 1994, um, a lot of the sentiment inside Armenia uh, is not autonomy. So, uh, with a lot of propaganda, uh, also autonomy Aram, inside Azerbaijan. Aram, could you stay in a certain position? Because if you move, the sound gets distorted. Or, yeah, good. Aram. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. 
Uh, great. Uh, okay. So I wanted to say that after the Armenian victory in 94, um, the idea of autonomy was gradually disc uh, discarded. Uh, and by that, I mean autonomy inside Azerbaijan. Um, so like a lot of the sentiment in Armenia and uh, also the sentiment in the Armenian and Nagorno-Karabakh governments um, rejected autonomy and uh, was making its goal the independence of Nagorno-Karabakh. Because I can say that in the 90s, um, Azerbaijan, which had just lost the war, was actually ready to provide high levels of autonomy. But then, of course, also the geopolitical uh, structures changed and um, Azerbaijan gradually also disc uh, discarded the idea of um, high levels of autonomy for the Nagorno-Karabakh region. And, um, and basically, um, the negotiations, at least the public sentiment in, in my country where I grew up, uh, never really uh, even discussed, like we never really even discussed the idea of autonomy. Of mm -hmm. course, in the negotiations, there have been several proposals, like six different proposals about, you know, autonomy or at least leaving or at least, you know, trying to contain the conflict and come to peace negotiations and leave the question of Karabakh status to the future in a referendum or a plebiscite. Um, but all of those um, proposals have either been rejected by Armenia or Karabakh or Azerbaijan. So that's the gist. And also one more important thing okay. is that, um, yeah, uh, yeah, one uh, one other last important thing I should mention is that uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh after the 1994 war, uh, there were around 40,000 of Azerbaijani refugees uh, who fled the, the Nagorno-Karabakh region itself. So any autonomy and any resolution to the conflict at the time uh, should have uh, and had to include uh, those people. So this complicated the matter even further. Thank you. Thank you for this report on this issue. Erdelan from Kurdistan racism. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Thank you, Aaron for the important introduction. I have a question, as I, you know, I, that I'm Turkey sorry, has I'm played sorry, an important role. Yeah, uh, yeah. Turkey has played an important role there in conflict in the region. Your, not, uh... There is something with your sound. Uh, this sound is very distorted. Uh, can you hear me now? Now I can hear you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Aram, for the important introduction. As you know, that Turkey has played an important key role in the region, especially to escalate the conflict and also becoming a part of the war crimes in the region. Because in the moment, as you see, also they are constantly attacking uh, in northeast Syria in Rojava and destroying the infrastructure and committing a lot of uh, war crimes. And they're also involving lot of the jihadis in the war uh, in Karabakh. And I want to ask you, uh, what do you think about uh, this uh, uh, multi-phase uh, role Turkey is playing because they are trying to show that they are creating, they are creating peace in, in Ukrainian crisis. But uh, in the other hand, they are also involving themselves uh, to occupy uh, 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 other places. Thank you, Erdogan. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, it, perhaps uh, we can collect some interventions, uh, especially with regard to Karabakh. Um, but uh, the next who has raised his hand was Tort. Yeah. 
but uh, I think it would be useful to uh, for for answering Erdelan first. I can come after. Okay, so Aram, please answer to Erdelan. Uh, thank you. Uh, can I, can everyone hear me? Yes. Great. So uh, the Turkish support of Azerbaijan um, in the war did not surprise me personally, and I don't think it surprised anyone. Turkey and Azerbaijan have had a, a partnership and very strong relations pretty much since the country's independence from the USSR and Azerbaijan and even before that. So um, Turkey having imperialist tendencies is also no surprise to anybody, I think. Uh, and we have seen that uh, those tendencies being enacted um, in uh, Rajava in North uh, and East Syria, and also in other areas of the Middle East. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, in the South Caucasus, I would say that Turkey is try trying to establish its power and its weight. Um, and somehow, I would say, in, in some cases, cooperate and in some cases, compete with Russia and Iran. Um, and of course, uh, the Turkish uh, arms uh, supplies to Azerbaijan have played a crucial role uh, in, in Azerbaijan's military offensive in, in the war it started. Uh, and have been um, very destructive to uh, to the civilian population in Nagorno-Karabakh and to the peace process in general. So um, that's there, and um, and of course, as I said before, the Turkish arms uh, were very much, uh, you know, being marketed in Nagorno-Karabakh. It was like a huge marketing ad for Turkey to try and uh, to try and sell its weapons to other countries as well, because those weapons, again, created a lot of destruction. I would like to uh, just answer to one thing about, uh, you mentioned uh, jihadists. Um, there have been reports about many military groupings from Syria being, um, being taken to Azerbaijan by Turkey to fight in the Karabakh war. And some of those groups have been Islamist and um, have uh, radical Islamist ideologies. But I would also like to mention that BBC did a report in 2019, I believe it was even during the war, that a lot of uh, the mercenaries uh, that Turkey brought to Azerbaijan were actually just like people who had no money and some of them uh, and a lot of them were not actually part of any groupings. They were just being used. They were. They didn't even know precisely where they were going, but they were being used as cannon fodder by Azerbaijan. So that's a more complicated uh, issue in and of itself uh, and is very much, and those people, some of those people at least, are very much the victims of Turkish and Azerbaijani uh, militarism and uh, warring tendencies and yeah this is like a more complicated issue than just the, the issue of jihadism and Islamism thank you okay <clears throat> I just wanted to say uh, in a sentence um, that I according to my understanding we are here of not only to report about uh, uh, what's happening and the objective realities uh, but uh, also if we could come up with some idea even if it seems illusionary <laughs> at the present moment but uh, some idea for peacemaking uh, coming from uh, the international civil society. That's just, if you can keep that in mind. Tort. Thank you. Uh, I think this is the most inspiring webinar I've been participating in concerning the present uh, crisis. Uh, and uh, certainly very much due to uh, addressing the Nagorno-Karabakh situation. 
uh, it is uh, embarrassing how all discussions more or less only focus on Ukraine. And here we have uh, uh, ethnic cleansing. I don't know the actual figures, but as far as I understand, it's something like uh, maybe 100,000 people or so. Uh, or even if it's only 50,000, it's uh, extreme and this complete silence, more or less. Uh, no uh, sort of ideas of uh, starting to uh, uh, do something effective about it. It's uh, silent. Uh, it is uh, the same kind of silence that have actually been at the core of the how the Ukraine conflict has been addressed. Uh, and it's uh, obviously that there is something here for the civil society, for the peace movement, but also all other movements to uh, follow up on this uh, webinar. Uh, I see several issues on the table here from the in, uh, interventions. Uh, one is uh, very important and has been more or less not discussed at all. And it's the issue of autonomy or some kind of, of, of uh, peaceful solutions to minority issues, etc. Uh, the other one is the relationship between pacifism and other ways of solving a conflict. Uh, uh, a third one is uh, how we label the main actors here is really Russia imperialist or not. Uh, and uh, if that is very important, I don't know because uh, people get killed. And whether the war of aggression against Ukraine is because of imperialism or simply because um, a militarized society that uh, starts to, to attack its neighbor, it's no difference for those who get killed. So, uh, but uh, it is, of course, a long tradition in the left to, to discuss these kind of things. Uh, it's done differently in the environmental movement, and I will come back to that. And then finally, of course, Sean Connor's intervention here, placing the whole issue in a global context. Where are actually the resources going? How can we have this uh, transition uh, for a social ecological transition? Uh, building peace, which is sort of the general uh, framework here, with some really insights from, from Sean Connor. Uh, I think that this issue of autonomy is utterly important to address. It's been a, a scandal that the peace movement haven't done that uh, sufficiently, especially in the Nordic countries, because the Nordic countries have excellent examples how to solve these kinds of conflicts. Uh, in Åland, which is a Swedish speaking, totally Swedish speaking region in Finland. And after the first world war, they all wanted to become members of the Swedish state more or less anyway, uh, far more than 90%. Uh, and this was uh, addressed uh, by the, the League of Nations and uh, the League of Nations refused uh, the local population, but they got extreme good uh, autonomy rules. It's the only region in Finland where you don't need to know Finnish. To, uh, uh, you don't need to know two languages to become a public uh, employed. In all other regions of Finland, you have to know both Swedish and Finnish. Maybe not in practice always, but anyway, officially, you have to know both languages. It's demilitarized and a lot of other fantastic autonomy rules. Uh, the final outcome was that uh, in the beginning, Ola was the poorest region in all of the Nordic country. And today it's the richest region. So with other words, this is a perfect example of how important autonomy uh, discussions are. Secondly, Schleswig, which was a region of a province in, in Denmark, uh, and uh, the Danish nationalism has some uh, similarities with the Ukrainian uh, nationalism. It was very strong, sort of, we have to be uh, fighting against everybody else, etc. And it was a small nation, 
uh, and it was attacked by Prussia and Austria because they started to claim that all people in Schleswig now have to start to learn Danish. And Schleswig was uh, very much a German speaking population. Uh, this caused this war, so uh, according to some uh, way Prussia and Austria claimed they, Denmark had uh, gone against some rules uh, internationally and, and uh, some kind of agreement and they conquered uh, Schleswig. And after the First World War, the solution was the complete opposite to Holland. There was a referendum in the north of Schleswig and the south of Schleswig. And in the south of Schleswig, uh, the population voted to be part of uh, Germany. And in the north, they voted to be part of Denmark, more or less everyone in both situations. And of course, they got lots and lots of minority rights, autonomy rights. Uh, I have a friend who visited the schools in this area and immediately the teacher said, come on, come and selected two pupils, uh, one Danish and one German, both could each other's language perfectly. And in Germany, uh, the Danish speaking population uh, had political rights and they achieve a parliamentary seat, even if they don't get above the, the, the normal levels you have to. So in other words, they're perfect examples. And for some idiotic reason, this very, very uh, weapon-focused uh, peace movement, don't discuss it. And we don't do it in the rest of the world either. And this is utterly uh, important to address because the Nagorno-Karabakh issue is not addressed, I think, primarily because it's not an example of Russian imperialism. In the first case, when it started, as far as my very superficial uh, thing, it has not been possible to put in the same context as Transnistria and South Ossetia, maybe today, but certainly not from the beginning, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But with other words, and this is certainly relevant for Kurdistan and other uh, ways as well, we have to go beyond only addressing issues of uh, weapons. And I think we will continue to discuss this in terms of the right of the Russian speaking population in Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, which is a disaster that especially the Swedish movement have not been addressing. It's time to speak up for all people, whether they are Russian or Armenians or whatever, uh, instead of being focused on the, the global level all the time. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, I, the other issues I think is also uh, very interesting in terms of that pacifism is the key to establish the idea that autonomy and other solutions can be useful, the key to struggle globally for this social ecological transition. There is no possibility to find any way forward without pacifism and of course I do also agree very much with Igor. We cannot uh, avoid uh, making our hands dirty and start also discuss who is actually going to intervene. So we get the stop uh, of things. It's fully possible to combine pacifism with some kind of uh, other kind of action as long as it's so democratic as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Tor. Opened up uh, the discussion to a broader scale. Uh, I personally uh, cannot agree more with what you said on autonomy from 2000 to 2005. Uh, we in our institute were coordinating a big project with 12 different institutes. Uh, from the East and from the West, uh, many of them also from Latin America, uh, taking up this issue of autonomy as conflict solution. Now, uh, the, uh, here writes uh, Yuri also, autonomy instead of sovereignty. Uh, uh, well, uh, the, this, the floor is open to anybody to, express uh, 
the opinions it's need not always be the speakers who answer, but the, uh, the floor is to you all. So uh, please raise your hand. Uh, Yuri. Uh, I would like to make a note uh, and totally agree with you regarding autonomy, uh, because we see uh, that Putin started his war of aggression because he actually thinks uh, it is uh, uh, necessary uh, to uh, um, extend uh, Russian sovereignty by military power. Uh, and he thinks uh, the world uh, now is going uh, to uh, be uh, a, a place uh, of uh, uh, battles between great power sovereignties. Uh, and uh, uh, President Zelensky uh, talking about his so-called peace formula, which is basically uh, a pretext to wage war forever, like Putin, totally like Putin. Uh, uh, he also uh, talks, first of all, about sovereignty. What is sovereignty? Sovereignty is absolute power uh, on some territory. Uh, and no power uh, could be uh, absolute. Uh, uh, it is just uh, law of nature. Uh, uh, every power have uh, uh, serious limitations. Starting from natural human freedom, you know, no government could control what people are thinking, believing. No, no uh, government uh, could resist uh, uh, light of truth and love in every human soul, light of conscience, which is saying to uh, everyone, you should not kill, you should not imagine some sort of enemies uh, and pretexts to kill enemies because it is unrealistic to kill all enemies. You just should stop, uh, uh, make people enemies and make some friends. And uh, uh, militarist ambitions to have this absolute power uh, to uh, uh, control uh, all which is happening in the world by sheer violent force is just unrealistic. And uh, uh, instead of this delusion of sovereignty, we must uh, develop uh, idea of autonomy. Autonomy is not absolute uh, delusional, but reasonable power. Uh, uh, care about uh, uh, others, uh, care about uh, uh, common interests of all people. Uh, and the uh, idea of autonomy, wonderfully developed in the concept of perpetual peace by Immanuel Kant, uh, uh, could be a, a philosophical basis. Uh, and uh, practical basis, because of course many practical technologies could be adopted, starting from nonviolent action, uh, to unite all people in the earth. That's why we need transition from violence of sovereignties towards nonviolence of autonomies. We need nonviolent governance. Yes, that reminds me uh, about uh, one week ago, approximately. Uh, uh, the International Peace Bureau organized a conference of uh, conference a, a speech uh, of uh, Mr. Gromiko, the grandson of the old uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of, of Russia, and uh, he was asked whether, with regard to Donbas, he could imagine. Uh, a solution acceptable for the Russian uh, government uh, to uh, for for Donbas, like it was already uh, conceived in the Minsk II agreement, and he said, uh, "For now, it is too late, but there must the the there could be a Minsk III agreement, which." Uh, uh, which which uh, could a sort of guarantee um, autonomy within the Russian Federation. And that's uh, uh, quite an interesting point of view of somebody who is close also to the Russian regime. Aram, you uh, uh, raised your hand. Uh, yes, uh, I just wanted to make a quick remark. Um, 
about the specifically what Mr. Bjork said. Um, I do agree with actually the fact that the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict hasn't been in the media and in the headlines as much because um, maybe um, the media hasn't been able to frame it as you know a result of Russian imperialism uh, the way they uh, they managed to do it and the way it was actually with some other conflicts you know just like Transnistria and Ukraine. <clears throat> and uh, that's an important point. There have been attempts to also try to frame it as a as a uh, result of Russian imperialism. But I would like to say that not only Russian, but uh, Western imperialism and also Turkish imperialism are the reasons for this conflict. And as for your point about um, ideas and solutions, possible solutions, uh, illusory as uh, um, they may be, the I would like to say from my side that right now, in the context that I live in, what we need uh, as a region is um, strong regional cooperation and uh, engagement of the populations and civilians be between Armenia and Azerbaijan um, and uh, decisive measures and... Um, decisive and structural conversations about uh, preventing wars in South Caucasus in the future. Because Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, being small nation states between uh, three other bigger nation states are not able to, um, you know, demilitarize their sub separate countries on their own. I do, I do believe that what we need right now is a strong and um, uh, you know result oriented measures and uh, conversations with each other uh, uh, direct conversations to try and prevent wars and escalations between the two countries in the future um, otherwise uh, all South Caucasus countries of course Georgia as well Armenia Azerbaijan and Georgia are, perpetually going to be the you know the foot the ball in the football field of uh, many major geopolitical powers so what we need right now is to talk to each other and what we need right now is to um, create strong peace activism because peace activism in Azerbaijan is uh of course, persecuted. Uh, a lot of peace activists have been persecuted uh, just in the past couple months, including the feminist collective. Uh, and uh, in Armenia as well, peace activism has been either infantilized or, uh, you know, um, it has been either infantilized or kind of neutralized with, uh, with this raging militarism. Uh, so in order to at least try to achieve some level of disarmament and some level of security also for the nations of Armenia and Azerbaijan and also for the residents of Nagorno-Karabakh who have had to flee their, uh, flee their homes, which I believe can and should be described as ethnic cleansing, it's, it's to somehow find ways to get out of this conflict uh, and uh, tr uh, find long-lasting solutions so that the, uh, the two peoples can cooperate. And also, I do believe that the residents of Nagorno-Karabakh, the Armenian population of Nagorno-Karabakh, should have the right to return to their home. Um, and uh, Azerbaijan is, is right now trying to give uh, some guarantees about, you know, cultural... Um, rights and uh, linguistic rights but that is not enough what we need is security guarantees from both Armenia and Azerbaijan for those people to return to their home because um, I you know it's been hard on citizens of both countries but it's been a, an absolute catastrophe for Nagorno-Karabakh residents who uh, were basically starving 
for nine months and then had to flee their homes um, with no real uh, realistic prospects of return. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was merely a final statement for this uh, slot, cooperation between civil society uh, in the conflict areas and outside also. Uh, if I leave the last word to Igor uh, before we change our time scale. Uh, I would have short remarks that uh, I have a great respect to the dedicated pacifist, uh, pacifists, um, I would say pacifist utopians like Yuri, but I think that uh, we should uh, take into account uh, the harsh realities around us. When there are armies, there is militarism, there are sovereign states, and uh, they are often uh, militarist uh, sovereign states. And uh, to act, uh, taking all this into account, when one, uh, when the containing force uh, is needed to prevent the expansion of militarism. And uh, the last thing, uh, this webinar, I think uh, one uh, conclusions is that we need more uh, topic-oriented discussions. Uh, actually, we had uh, uh, have had a discussion very much focused on. Uh, Caucasus on Nagorno-Karabakh here, and uh, I think it was uh, rather fruitful. Uh, and uh, other discussions are needed, maybe specifically um, one, for example, discussion specifically uh, focused on Ukraine, uh, discussion specifically focused on Russia, uh, also on other things. Uh, just now we are observing all this fighting in Palestine and Syria and uh, other things. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, uh, topic-specific, topic-focused discussions uh, would be maybe more useful than uh, more general ones. So I think that uh, this will be continued in other discussions and also that this will uh, lead to some real actions in real world on specific uh, areas. Thank you. Now there is a three minute pause until we start again uh, at 12 with the next subject. Welcome in, well, two minutes. <laughs> Ciao. Ciao. Thank you for all very much. Uh, it was a very fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Hej Per, Hej. Eh, vi har fått igång webbinariet nu, det rullar på bra här, eh, men eh, jag ser inte att eh, Alexei har dykt upp. Eh, Oksana och Juri är med oss, men inte Alexei. Har du möjlighet att få tag på honom eller? Alltså jag har inte så bra kontakt med honom längre, han bor ju i Paris. Ah, ja, ja. Han har ju bekräftat, vi har haft konversation och han har bekräftat att han skulle vara med. Men, ja. men du har alltså inget telefonnummer eller sånt där heller då? Nej, jag brukar mest ha på Facebook. Okej, okay, då, då gör jag det. Och så har hans mejl och sådär. Ja, ja, ja. ja topp, bra, fint. Hej. Hej.
<clears throat> well, hello, every hello, everybody again. Maybe there was one minute for taking some thing to drink or so. This session will deal with the issue of how to work against repression, both in the East and the West. It has been interesting to see how finally this issue to jointly question the repression have opened up for a much broader unity than when we address uh, sort of who is actually to blame for wars and conflicts and so on. And I hope uh, that this session we will have will, as the first one we have, widen our capacity to, to confront the situation where we in the whole world actually are facing quite a lot of problems for the movements. There's quite a lot of, of, of uh, disunity, but I think now as an environmental activist, there is a growing concern and understanding that we are facing a much, much more militarized society that both in terms of international relations, but also domestic uses more and more sort of repression against the movements, which can be clearly seen when it comes to climate activism, who is now labeled terrorists or sabotage actors in more and more country, including in Sweden. So uh, it is an issue where we can maybe start to get some kind of, of uh, understanding that we have to stand up uh, maybe uh, in a more general way, uh, both uh, addressing those specific cases that are very little addressed, but also to understand that by bringing them together, as we try to do now, we might strengthen uh, further unity. We have invited uh, Oksana Shelisheva, uh, who has been very strongly advocating human rights, first in Russia, uh, and then <clears throat> declared sort of persona non grata in Russia and in Estonia. So she has a perfect record <laughs> of being, <laughs> standing up for human rights everywhere without double standards. She can say something more. Uh, we have here Yuri Shelyashenko, who has, also been standing up and is now presently accused by the, the Ukrainian security police for promoting Russian aggressiveness. He can explain this more. We have also invited uh, Alexei Sashnin, who is a Russian uh, political refugee, as Oksana. Unfortunately, uh, I don't see he has turned up. He is uh, presently living in France, and there might be problems with the connections or whatsoever. Uh, there is the possibility to, uh, what we have been doing very much is to try to get free cases up on the table. The International Peace Bureau together with us in Sweden been addressing the issue of Boris Kagarlitsky, a well-known left-wing activist in uh, Russia who has been in detained and is uh, threatened by some seven years in prison. Yuri Shelyashenko, who has uh, this uh, Ukrainian case, and Olga Karash from Belarus, who is uh, <clears throat> present in Lithuania and is not achieving political asylum, uh, and uh, has, uh, her stage is also in, in a, a hard situation. Uh, so, with other words, we are facing uh, different case studies, but the discussion can also develop further. So, 
First, I give the word to Oksana. Well, thank you. Thank you, Tord. Thank you, everybody. Um, you know, it's not, well, this is a coincidence, but uh, it's uh, a meaningful coincidence that uh, this event is taking pl place on uh, October the 7th. And uh, for me, this day will ever be the day of the murder of Anna Politkovska. And uh, uh, in my view, so it was uh, one of the first uh, political assassinations which started to pave the road to our current reality of um, double standards, injustice, wars, uh, camouflaged uh, uh, under the definitions of special operations or anti-terrorist actions and uh, what, whatsoever. Um, I need uh, to uh, clarify that uh, after the uh, new stage in the war in Ukraine launched by Russia in February 2022, I uh, was indeed targeted by Estonia, and uh, uh, but I won the case in court. And now I have um, the court decision in Estonia and claim, well, stating that actually uh, my views um, as a journalist and a human rights defender have nothing to do with any kind of apologies to any oppressive regime. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the situation remains very complicated, and uh, I, I do uh, believe in the power of um, nonviolent uh, actions. Um, well, one of the most evident proofs to that is the way how the first war in Chechnya was stopped by signing peace agreement in 1996, and uh, it was uh, very much thanks to their um, one million signatures collected uh, on the initiative by Boris Nemtsov in Nizhny Novgorod region, who was actually advised to launch that campaign by many of my friends as I, um, as Nizhny Novgorod became my, um, so to say, sole city. So uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, um, so this kind of, uh, internal uh, strife against unfair wars uh, wasn't the reality in Ukraine in from, let's say, 2014. And unfortunately, I hear today that uh, even the Ukrainian peace pacifists uh, uh, de well describe uh, the residents of southern eastern parts of Ukraine as uh, Russians. I remember in 2014 when I took the first, uh, when I made the first trip uh, from Donetsk to Lugansk, those people described themselves as Ukrainians. And many of them, if not the majority, speak Ukrainian as well as Russian. So unfortunately it wasn't noticed. Um, well, you know, I started to speak about, uh, to I started with the reminder of Anna Politkovska and her role because um, uh, she is the one who I personally um, miss a lot. And I suppose that their entire human rights movement uh, and peace movement um, lacks now because she really was an absolute integrant person with uh, uh, no inclination to support or justify any kind of double standard. And uh, she proved it with her life and with her work, because I have to remind that uh, she uh, was also very much supportive uh, towards the mothers of uh, uh, those Russian soldiers uh, who were, well, who were used to fight in Chechnya, and so she was the one, actually the only one, who came to observe the trials on uh, MVP people um, in 2004, and actually thanks to her coverage of those political trials, 
um, there, well, something like 42 young people didn't get very really severe sentences. Um, and I remember that when they came, some of them, those, uh, some of those defendants came to work uh, with us at the Russian Chechen Friendship Society at the very tough period of our time when we were under uh, a lot of pressure. And we um, held our job interviews with uh, them, warning that we are a dangerous organization, that actually there might be some uh, consequences to their work with us. Uh, then it turned out that those uh, young people really knew um, because what consequences they might face because actually they were the ones who Anna Politkovska rescued from imprisonment. And uh, I remember one girl, her name is Yelena, and she told about her absolute bewilderment when she saw Anna Politkovska coming into the court hall uh, the first time when they were in the cage. And this Yelena told her that nobody invited her and nobody expected her to come to our support because she was perceived as a liberal journalist who speaks up against the persecution of Chechens only. So it didn't happen to be true. And uh, she was very genuine about that, I have to say. And uh, um, this is a very strong example of how important it is now not to uh, try to find uh, ours among those who are being persecuted, who are being targeted. So, um, okay, so this uh, uh, remark about um, Ukrainians in the East and uh, South to be Russians, isn't it the reason why Russian-speaking Latvian journalists and Russian-speaking pensioners are not being supported, are not being taken care of the, by the international community. Is it because they are Russians? Is it because their language that they regard as their native to be Russian? I am afraid that this is the case. You know, so one of the most notorious um, examples of uh, the current reality is this uh, massive case in Latvia against uh, uh, 14 journalists who are on trial. It started with a curtailment of uh, and different kind of problems for uh, local Latvian Russian language outlets. Then when those journalists lost possibility to work inside country and they started to cover Latvia for uh, the Russian media, now they are targeted because of that. So when Dost was invited to move uh, to uh, Latvia as a safe haven, so actually didn't last, their happiness didn't last for long. So they were kicked out with a lot of problems for them. Just because uh, the tone of one of the programs wasn't regarded as uh, admissible as they are Russian journalists. Now, uh, Medusa publicly tells that actually uh, their co-founders, Galina Timchinska's uh, phones uh, were affected by malware and they suspect the authorities of Latvia to be behind that. Well, I don't even speak about the attempt to deport uh, those pensioners, when we speak, when uh, the uh, actually even Russian media, when they cover the situation in Latvia with regard to attempt to kick out uh, thousands of Russian speaking Latvians out of the country, they kind of forget one simple fact that these, they speak about pensioners, they speak about those people who actually worked their entire life for Latvia paying money to the budget of Latvia. The case is about pensioners who have all connections inside Latvia, who have their families and their ancestral graves in Latvia, 
and who have no connection whatsoever uh, to Russia, and they don't have relatives in Russia, in the most cases. And if uh, the international community so prefers to keep eyes closed on this reality, so what to expect next? Um, well, there was a, a, a social forum held in Finland uh, not long ago, and uh, I came there to uh, to meet people and to speak with some of the people. You know, what was stunning was that there was not even a single flyer reminding of Boris Kogarlitsky, although he was a very frequent guest in Finland. And his articles and his books actually were published in Finland. I was I was surprised because actually uh, Boris Kogarlitsky is a victim of, uh, of the Russian repressive uh, machine. Why not to speak up at least in his defense that's a big question which nobody, nobody, nobody can answer. Um, in Lithuania, uh, there is a case of uh, Algir Despalietskis, who is the leader of Social Democrats. And well, actually, the person who uh, was very well kind of established in the, in the political structure of Latvia with a, uh, very deep roots in the political history of Lithuania, sorry, not Latvia, Lithuania. Uh, you know, he is, a, if, you know, some of you know that he is in prison now, serving his um, um, white harsh sentence, and I'm in correspondence with him. Just a couple of days ago, I received a, a letter from Algir Despalietskis in in which he explains the reasons why he decided not to go to the European Court um, for Human Rights in Strasbourg with his case. And uh, the reason is that, as he tells in this letter, that he has lost any trust or hope uh, with the European structures. But at the same time, and that is my um, proposal to consider, we, with which I entirely agree uh, that uh, there, is, there are UN human rights mechanisms, and that is uh, the way how he is going to address uh, his own case uh, in the nearest uh, future. So there might be a lot of criticism um, about uh, UN or the OAC, which is now seems to be very uh, helpless. But, you know, so when I was listening to Tor Bjork and uh, his uh, short intervention about the complicated history uh, between Finland and Sweden and the situation of the Orland Islands. So I can tell that uh, this is a very good example, uh, which we really should um, keep in mind. Um, I can tell that... Um, Already after this war in Ukraine started, uh, I got a possibility to make a three month course uh, with their uh, Peace Institute of the Orland Islands. And the course was focused on the issue of the autonomy as a, a way how to find uh, um, um, solutions in the armed conflicts. And in the final paper, which I made for this, um, uh, for the Peace Institute in the Orland Islands, actually, I um, uh, reminded about the attempts which um, Alexander Hook, in his capacity of the um, senior observer with the OEC monitoring mission to Ukraine, had uh, made uh, you know, again, there, there have been a lot of criticism from all possible sides about uh, the work of the uh, OEC monitoring mission to Ukraine. Unfortunately, there is no mechanism now to fix the situation, even in the limited way they uh, managed to do, but they did fix the cases on a daily basis which is a very important uh, thing which we lack now. Now there is only UN human rights monitoring mission to Ukraine with very scarce 
uh, possibilities in comparison with what the OAC human uh, monitoring mission had. But um, I have to remind about uh, one statement made by Alexander Hook when uh, the Finnish peace organizations were kind of active um, on Ukraine. And uh, in 2000, uh, 2017, uh, Alexander Hook came to Finland on uh, invitation from, uh, from the Finnish um, uh, peace organizations. So, and I interviewed him then, and what he told me in that interview um, with regard to the reasons of the Minsk agreement's implementation failures. He told them, it was 2017, part of the problem is that the measures that had been agreed to bring about stability from a military point of view, but also development from the political, economic, and humanitarian point of view are not implemented. And one big obstacle is that non-implementation, so non-adherence to commitments made, leads to a lack of incentive to adhere to what had been agreed, because there is no cost for failure to adhere to it, be it political, economic, humanitarian, or security measures. And I regard it to be uh, the most important reason um, of the failure of the Minsk uh, agreements. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sana, for this very important, non-biased way to focus on solutions. And also seeing that here is a lot more to do that we in the peace movement have sort of missed uh, important aspects of, of the crisis where we actually could move forward. Uh, so now I give the word to Yuri and uh, Kiev, and great to see you here, and uh, not only you, but your fantastic background. <laughs> well, uh, yes, uh, uh, thank you, Tord, and I should be helpful to friends who uh, brought this peace flag and some other peace flags to Kiev. Uh, uh, it uh, uh, have inscribing uh, from the family of European Bureau for Conscientious Objection uh, to Ukrainian Pacifist Movement 2022. Uh, the small letters here on, on the flag. Anyway, uh, hugs and greetings uh, to all IPB peace family, to all pro-peace people uh, of all political uh, views in the world. Uh, uh, hugs and greetings from uh, a Kiev from a pacifist under house arrest. I am under house arrest now. My house arrest was prolonged uh, uh, till uh, 30th November and also from a threat to be imprisoned for five years. I am accused uh, in justification of Russian aggression in a statement which in fact condemns Russian aggression. Uh, uh, this is absurd political repressions. It is revenge of President Zelensky militarist regime for my advocacy of peace by peaceful means and human right to conscientious objection to military service. By the way, uh, uh, participation of Russian anti-war left activist Alexei Sakhnin announced today uh, I am eager to hear him uh, uh, because I am accused by security service of Ukraine in so-called contact <laughs> with him, as well as with, with uh, one of leaders of Russian movement of conscientious objection, uh, uh, Yelena Popova. Uh, uh, I, I uh, know Popova, I don't know Sakhnin, and uh, well, uh, uh, maybe met one time or two at one of online events. Uh, uh, may be organized by this network, and uh, I am curious uh, why they link him to me. Uh, I am I am curious to listen to him. Maybe get acquainted anyway. Um, so uh, here in Ukraine, uh, when Russian war of aggression continues, uh, continues to devastate to destroy my country. You could feel, as I feel, in strongest possible way that we need peace. Yesterday, Russian army brutally bombed Kharkiv and Odessa. People are killed. Tens of homes destroyed. This madness must be stopped. And uh, violence can't bring peace. Uh, 
We need viable way to peace by peaceful means. We need ceasefire. We need fair and inclusive peace talks in a scale of national and international civil society dialogue, not uh, 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 under the closed doors. Inclusive peace dialogue, narrative change. Uh, peace dialogue mediated by the peace movements in Russia and in Ukraine. And of course, it uh, will help, uh, help to change regimes. We, we need uh, big changes in economy and society in every corner of our common planet towards nonviolent gardens and abolition of militarism. Have no illusions. It is dangerous utopia to try to achieve peace by killing all enemies or by returning to the past. It is utopia to achieve peace using army. It is utopia to uh, achieve peace by uh, murder. Uh, no peace could be achieved by murder. Only big changes. I would say nonviolent revolution could counter existing plans to continue war in Ukraine for decades. These plans are a result of structural problem of militarized economy, which escalates conflicts and generates war and represses pacifists, of course. I will show it very quickly in, in my presentation. One moment, I will share my screen. Um, where is this button, magic button? Ah, here it is. Uh, so uh, uh, oh. here, here you see him. Hello. Uh, I I uh, uh, I will show you uh, very shortly. Uh, you you see the escalation ladder, the funnel of Russia-Ukraine conflict. Uh, uh, it uh, 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 from uh, um, uh, 90s years uh, when uh, Ukraine and Russia emerged as independent countries after the solution of Soviet Union, uh, there were hopes uh, for a peaceful existence together. And of course, it was different hopes. In Russia, it was uh, hopes for domination, uh, peaceful domination in post-Soviet space. And in Ukraine, it were hopes for peaceful divorce with Russia. Uh, uh, then uh, started alienation, economic competition, uh, um, this race uh, who will join NATO, and then uh, uh, because of uh, uh, ambitions uh, in Russian military uh, to dominate Eurasian space, because of NATO's ambitions to expand and uh, rule the world, uh, we came to current uh, uh, situation uh, when instead of win-win, uh, 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 in fact, uh, uh, phase uh, of uh, uh, conflict uh, uh, which amounts to peace, uh, when, where all conflicts are resolved uh, to mutual benefit of everyone, we have totally opposite thing. We have lose-lose phase of conflict, where uh, uh, peoples, where militaries are ready to destroy each other, uh, to destroy themselves, to harm other. And we have uh, these risks of nuclear escalation. It is disaster. I, I described this conflict using uh, famous uh, uh, conflict escalation model of Professor Friedrich Glasel. Uh, he reviewed uh, this, by the way, and you could find on the website, uh, on the blog of uh, um, scientific journal um, uh, uh, Wissenschaft and Freedom, uh, uh, his uh, review of this. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I uh, want uh, to show you uh, road in opposite direct direction, because uh, we, we could uh, go through this escalation ladder in opposite direction. Uh, when Putin uh, uh, thinks uh, that violence uh, could uh, uh, help him to achieve his utopian view uh, of uh, uh, dominating in Eurasia uh, by sheer military force and uh, 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 nuclear superiority, while President Zelensky 
uh, stubbornly asks more and more weapons and uh, uh, advocate his pretext for waging war forever, so-called peace formula, which includes, by the way, a continuation uh, of um, uh, defense war during decades and total mobilization of whole population uh, to war, which is not realistic, of course. Uh, people are just uh, resisting, uh, uh, as by the way, people resisted uh, uh, under Russian Empire and under Soviet Union uh, to uh, conscription efforts. There is a big uh, culture of nonviolent resistance to this military mobilization. Uh, anyway, uh, it is not realistic to uh, continue this war for decades. And uh, how to stop it, you see uh, on, on this slide. We, we could uh, return uh, from lose-lose uh, phase of conflict, which is a uh, uh, um, uh, phase of war, to win-win uh, phase, which is phase of peace. Uh, we need to refuse to kill, uh, refuse to defeat, to curse, uh, refuse to threat, to manipulate, to hate. Uh, 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 and furthermore, we should refuse to uh, distance, uh, to deny others, to ignore others. Russians and Ukrainians could re refuse to kill each other. Uh, we could uh, start uh, peace talks to find common ground. We could uh, uh, advocate disarmament instead of pressure each other. We could reconcile it instead of deter, and uh, uh, um, Ukraine and Russia could seek fair deal, not some sort of playing for time. Uh, we could, instead of hating each other, seek agreement and reconciliation. And uh, 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 by this uh, approach, we could come closer. Uh, we could uh, uh, achieve uh, um, understanding uh, and respect to common interests and natural unity of all people. Human rights is basis of natural unity of all people. Uh, and by this way, we could uh, ensure that nobody and nothing uh, is uh, ignored or abused. We, we could achieve peace. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, idea how to uh, walk uh, through escalation ladder in opposite direction of de-escalation uh, towards uh, peace. Uh, uh, I, I agree with uh, uh, Igor Gottlieb, uh, uh, who noted on the previous panel about necessity of regime change by nonviolent means to add. Uh, uh, away from militarism everywhere and in Russia as soon as possible, of course. And, and you know, uh, now uh, nonviolent action is on crossroads. Many people uh, are using nonviolent action uh, to advocate war, weapons supplies to Ukraine and so on. It is inappropriate. Uh, uh, this uh, meeting uh, in Kiev under uh, mayor's office asking to stop spending on uh, city community needs and uh, start to spend on, uh, on the military. Uh, it, it is just disgusting. And uh, I am proud that uh, uh, in uh, uh, the citadel of uh, United States imperialism, uh, uh, some people with common sense demand exactly the opposite. It is right kind of nonviolent resistance where, when people are saying nonviolent uh, uh, negotiations, yes, escalation, no. Uh, uh, I, I must uh, disagree with Igor, uh, pacifism works, uh, nonviolent identity works, we need instead of just nonviolent action, develop nonviolent identity. Uh, and uh, uh, in uh, uh, history of humankind, uh, in uh, history of Russia and Ukraine, there are uh, a lot examples uh, how uh, people uh, to uh, 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 resisted uh, uh, invasions, uh, um, bloodshed uh, without violence, resisted uh, military uh, recruitment without violence. Uh, you know, uh, um, Herbert Wells, uh, in his uh, uh, outline of history, wrote uh, that history is common adventure uh, of uh, humankind. Uh, and uh, without understanding uh, of uh, uh, common character of history, uh, it is impossible to achieve peace within and between society. Uh, and uh, this uh, history of all peoples, not just uh, Ukrainians, Russians, uh, Americans, Chinese, uh, all people are part of big family of uh, humankind. 
examples of nonviolent resistance are usually focused on such extreme examples as a tank man. We, uh, and every nation uh, has their own tank men. Uh, I mentioned Chinese, well, uh, famous tank men in China. Uh, but, but we had this in Russia and in, in Ukraine. Uh, unarmed communities stopped Russian tanks during full-scale invasion uh, of Russia uh, 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 when Russia invaded Ukraine in uh, uh, 2022, and earlier in eastern Ukraine when un unarmed people stopped Ukrainian tanks. Uh, I, I refer you to wonderful report of Professor Philip Daza, published by Novakt uh, about Ukrainian nonviolent resistance to Russian aggression. Russian use of uh, nonviolence is less documented, but it is well known fact that um, pro Russian civilians took Ukrainian military bases in Crimea. Unarmed civilians could prevail over, over armed men. It is a fact Ukrainians and Russians perfectly know. Uh, but in both impre impressive cases, problem is solidarity of civilians with army. And uh, it was especially problematic in 2014 among pro-Russian circles uh, because some agitated people under influence of Russian propaganda supported Russian occupation of Crimea and Donbass contrary to international law. Uh, Nonviolent action should not be subordinated to military strategies, especially, of course, talking about Russian war of aggression against Ukraine. Unfortunately, trust to armies uh, squandered nonviolent efforts, and the armies in every country are evil number one, especially if they are occupiers, such as Russian army in Ukraine. But I believe uh, there could be no our own army for any reasonable civilian. Any army is instrument of military tyranny and uh, it violates human rights all the time. Uh, see the forced recruitment to Putin's mid grinder in Russia in Ukrainian territories by occupying Russian army contrary to force Geneva Convention. And this blatant abuses must be resisted nonviolently. Conscientious objection is principal mean of nonviolent resistance, civil disobedience. As you uh, saw, uh, refusal uh, to kill uh, is a first step in uh, the escalation ladder. Unfortunately, Ukrainian army refuses to recognize right to refuse to kill. And along with office of President Zelensky, the army instigates political repressions against me. Uh, draft evasion in Ukraine uh, is punishable up to three years of jail, uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, uh, there are uh, uh, examples uh, uh, when people uh, are sentenced uh, uh, um, recently uh, um, in Ivano-Frankivsk, uh, um, uh, Christian pacifist Mikhail Yavorsky uh, was uh, uh, sentenced uh, uh, for his uh, uh, conscientious objection. Uh, Vitaly Alexeyenko uh, uh, was prisoner of conscience several months. Uh, we worked uh, uh, to provide him legal aid and Supreme Court uh, released him, uh, but uh, he is still under threat uh, uh, of uh, uh, imprisonment. He is uh, under retrial ordered by uh, Supreme Court. And uh, Andriy Vishnevetsky, our brave member of Ukrainian pacifist movement, uh, who uh, uh, is uh, in fact a uh, uh, serviceman uh, in army, in frontline unit, uh, who uh, submitted from the trenches lawsuit to President Zelensky asking him uh, uh, to um, establish procedure uh, of um, uh, discharge from military service on the ground of conscience. We don't have such procedure, despite Ukraine is member of uh, Council of Europe and uh, Cabinet of Ministers of Council of Europe in the resolution regarding uh, recommendations regarding human rights of military personnel uh, um, says that uh, uh, servicemen have a right to conscientious objection and they should be provided uh, with a procedure uh, uh, of uh, discharge from military service on the grounds of conscience. Unfortunately, Supreme Court uh, uh, on uh, 25th September uh, um, uh, refused to grant this lawsuit. Uh, and uh, uh, they uh, wrote uh, in judgment 
uh, that the country uh, could limit uh, during the martial law uh, some human rights, including they wrote uh, um, uh, uh, right to conscientious objection uh, under uh, uh, right to freedom of religion or belief under Article 18 of International Covenant for Civil and Political Rights. Furthermore, they quoted uh, Article 4 of this covenant, uh, uh, but uh, Article 4, they quoted uh, uh, the uh, uh, first paragraph, which is saying that some rights could be limited, but they didn't quote the uh, second paragraph, which says that uh, uh, rights enshrined in Article 18 couldn't uh, be uh, limited. Uh, uh, this rights, uh, uh, this uh, including right to conscientious objection to military service is not derogable even in time of war. And the whole history says that uh, right to conscientious objection is especially precious during the war. In fact, uh, it was uh, uh, firstly uh, um, guaranteed by serious legal uh, uh, provisions uh, in the United Kingdom exactly uh, during the First World War. Uh, and, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, this uh, mm, uh, decision, this judgment of Supreme Court uh, uh, will be uh, uh, challenged. We will lodge appellate complaint and, and I hope uh, uh, we will help um, Andrei Vishnevetsky to return to his wife and to his daughter uh, from slavery uh, of uh, military uh, service. Uh, to, to conclude, um, uh, now I am under uh, persecution uh, uh, for uh, uh, just having a dream, uh, for just having a dream of the world without wars, just having a dream that a shameful criminal Russian aggression against Ukraine could be stopped without violence. Uh, like uh, if uh, more people with common sense uh, uh, will demand changes in Russia, uh, maybe Russian troops will, will be withdrawn from Ukraine and uh, any threats to, to Ukraine and other countries uh, uh, could be minimized. Uh, we uh, uh, expressed uh, this hope uh, for better uh, peaceful future in uh, the statement Peace Agenda for Ukraine and the World on the open meeting of Ukrainian pacifist movement. Uh, uh, video record of this movement you could find in the internet. Uh, and uh, uh, it is beyond my imagination how cynical, how insane some people could be uh, in the uh, security service of Ukraine, in the office of president, because we said uh, this uh, statement to Office of President, and instead of considering our petition, Office of President started this political repressions. It is beyond my imagination uh, uh, why uh, they even could think that the statement which condemns Russian aggression supposedly uh, justifies it. It is just a uh, um, result of distorted uh, uh, perception of reality uh, uh, by a party to conflict. Uh, 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 imagining uh, fictional enemies such as uh, uh, Kiev Nazi or Moscow Nazi or uh, uh, evil West. Uh, 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 These uh, uh, fictional enemies uh, are also a result of distortion of perception of reality. And uh, Professor Glasel, uh, uh, who's uh, um, uh, worldwide known uh, 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 conflict researcher, uh, whose book uh, I admire, uh, books I admire and have them on the bookshelf uh, near me, uh, 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 he described this in result of uh, uh, fundamental. Uh, uh, scientific study. Uh, uh, I, I wish more people could be educated to understand it and to return uh, from this distorted perception reality uh, to realism and sanity of scientific pacifist worldview. Uh, so uh, uh, in this, this peace agenda for Ukraine and the world, uh, we proposed outline uh, how to achieve peace by peaceful means. We must uphold human right to refuse to kill. We must tell the truth, uh, uh, um, uh, especially uh, 
that violence uh, could not uh, uh, bring to peace, that weapons are uh, not protecting people, but killing the people. We need to learn and teach practical knowledge about peaceful life without violence or with its minimization. And uh, we uh, need uh, to help those who are needy, uh, who uh, are under political repressions, uh, uh, who uh, uh, suffer uh, from war effort, people who lost uh, home uh, because of uh, criminal actions uh, of Russian army in Ukraine and maybe uh, uh, also uh, uh, in result of uh, uh, criminal actions of other armies because uh, war is criminal enterprise and any army waging war, even defensive war, uh, could not avoid uh, uh, committing crimes. So we, we need to tell truth uh, that war is a crime against humanity and therefore we should not support any kind of war and we should strive for the removal of all causes of war. Uh, I, I hope uh, uh, together uh, uh, during uh, this uh, mobilization week towards uh, peace in Ukraine and uh, during other uh, peace activities uh, um, uh, in um, uh, enacted by resolution of Vienna Peace Summit uh, and uh, other voices of common sense, we could uh, together uh, uh, build better uh, uh, world without wars. Um, uh, there is a, a great dream that in the world where everybody refused to kill, there will be no wars. This dream uh, wars uh, uh, to put our common efforts uh, to make it real. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuri. Uh, I put in the chat now uh, the three main campaigns which we are supporting concerning Yuri, yes, uh, which you can sign, and also Boris Kagalitsky and Olga Karash. Uh, so you are most welcome to join this. Uh, I have some communication with Alexei Sashnin, who has been able to join the meeting now, but have some problems with micro. I guess this is but Alexei. Probably you can hear me. Oh, yes. Welcome. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so, welcome, Alexei. You can uh, continue here. <clears throat> well, uh, comrades, I will take just a couple of minutes. I feel myself very depressed. I want to begin to send my all my solidarity to Yuri and to his feelings, his uh, struggle and his values as well. But unfortunately, I'm very pessimistic about uh, perspectives of the, let's say, peaceful, non-violent resistance, at least in Russia. I just want to tell you a very short story about my two personal friends. One of them is quite known, and many of you signed a letter in support of him. It's Boris Kogarlitsky. Boris Kogarlitsky. He was arrested in late Ju July and sitting in the Northern Autonomous Republic Komia in very special jail, jail controlled by FSB directly and well known by uh, cases of hard pressure. He's quite optimistic, not as me, not depressed. Uh, he's uh, writing me let letters and explains that uh, uh, he has privileges because uh, we all are paralyzed and he is just sitting in a cell. He uh, should not make that uh, moral choice every day should not try. Uh, I want to call you to continue solidarity with Boris and with all other Russian political prisoners. The number of them are getting more and more. And just let me tell about our common with Boris friend. I will not call his name because uh, he is now in hospital in Crimea. He was shot in uh, 
the most terrible place of front line in Ukraine. He was a member of anti-war um, group, one of many small leftist anti-war groups. And somehow he get on front line. I guess there were few reasons. And one of them is money. Because Russian soldiers, as you know, got quite big in Russian scale money. But the second and probably main reason was pressure. The choice he had was uh, to become a political prisoner or to become a soldier on the front line. And he decided himself to, and like he explained himself, that he would be kind of Bolshevist, Bolshevik agitator on the front line. I don't believe that he would be successful. After four days on front line, he was shot. I mean, you know, in such a situation, probably, probably he have a chance because I'm I I wrote in the morning the analysis of the criminal cases against uh, deserters. And they are growing, the number of such cases growing up very quickly. During first year of war, it grew up on four times. And our last data is just uh, March and April. Probably my second friend decided correct. And it's the only one organized and weaponed force in society which can let changes start, which can begin changes. But we are, all of us, are out of Russia. And what we can do is to run solidarity campaigns with uh, political prisoners. They really need it to send them letters, to inform our societies about their fate. But in order to make that solidarity campaigns effective, we should politicize them. We should make them not just human rights cases. We should transform them to a political campaign. And one of the goal in that, in such a campaign, should be destroying of Russian regime. And until the moment, many of us are still supposing that it's a chess game between two imperialists and does not take in attention the fate of activists, mobilized soldiers from the assholes to cities and towns and just usual people, we would be never able to create alternative, to formulate conditions of peace and strategy of peace, which would be acceptable for usual people, regular people for, on the both sides of the front line. Because until we are still thinking that it's too imperialist players. And we have to choose between them. We are indeed playing on one or other side of that criminal, unlimited, bloody war. Uh, sorry for my сбивчивый, um, как сказать, Юрий. Oh, well, uh, a bit chaotic. <laughs> a bit chaotic speech. I'm really depressed. Uh, our depressed friends with you in solidarity. Depressed and feel powerless when I'm speaking with Western politicians. And they are Western left politicians. Let's say Western left radical politicians. Jean-Luc Mélenchon. 
for example. And they are trying to do all they can to avoid the problem, just to not say anything. Because if they will say, they would be destroyed by media if they would say they, they are usual rhetoric, or they would be recognized as a Biden or Macron friends if they will change. And it's catastrophic. If even left side of society is not able to formulate the new social essence of peace, the proposition to soldiers, not to governments, then I don't know what to do. I don't know where to speak, whom to call, to call to what? Just write letters to political prisoners, sign, sign the public letters. They will not be accepted or listened until this war will finish. And the only one chance to transform that humanitarian issue to a material force is to politicize them, to discuss to discuss fate of prisoners as a fate of war. Thanks, comrades. I spent a lot of forces to fight with my micro and speech gets even more chaotic than I expected. But you made it, Alexei, and we are very grateful very grateful because we need these different voices and we cannot only have political rational analysis etc we have to face that this is about human beings uh, now we have a problem we have uh, two speakers uh, announced and there's a question from sean connor in the chat and we are supposed to end in three minutes and then have a lunch break. Uh, normally, I'm a bureaucrat. Uh, Alexei knows Swedish idiotic bureaucrats, <laughs> as you were a refugee here for several years. Uh, so uh, uh, I will propose anyway that we extend. But then please uh, be very short, Oksana and Aram. And I will state what uh, you can see shown said there in the in, in the chat please Oksana yes thank you well first and foremost um I do support all the slogans uh demanding the rights to conscientious objectors and peace all over the world but this is not the time for declaring slogans uh it's already too late uh, it's necessary to come up with some concrete proposals some little steps uh, which can make uh, implement these uh, uh, slogans into real life. I do understand the feelings of Alexei and uh, I, my sympathy is with you and with your friends. I, I do know that because recently I've been contacted by people from Ukraine who managed to cross the border because they don't want to um, be victims of this uh, uh, bloodshed. I was contacted by people in Russia uh, or from Russia who are stuck in Europe because uh, they are not accepted as political uh, refugees uh, just because they don't want to be, uh, to be drafted to the army. The number of these people is immense. And uh, also in Finland, for instance, um, uh, there is a group of uh, some 35 Russian men who managed to flee Russia in the period from February to March 2022. Their fate is still undecided and actually they don't know what to do with them because actually they, um, the immigration authorities of Finland, as they explained to me just tell, we are waiting for the decision uh, from Brussels whether to see you as a, um, a candidates to get political asylum. So these are the concrete steps which we need to consider. And I have to also remind you of um, 
And the fact that today another war started, this is already the third, the third big war in the period of, uh, in a very short period of time. So this is not the time to uh, expect that some of us or all of us just accept our righteousness. There is no time left. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, please. Yeah, okay, thanks. So, unfortunately, I'm gonna have to leave the meeting soon um, because I uh, have some things I need to do. So, I just wanted to make a couple of remarks. Uh, first of all, I want to extend uh, my solidarity to everyone and specifically to Russian and Ukrainian anti-war activists. Um, I know how anti-war activism, peace activism and anti-militarism as an activism can drain people and drain our personal lives in general. Uh, and I understand the depression and the anger because uh, I felt it myself. I uh, wanted to say that um, Alexei mentioned about uh, mentioned avoiding the problem, and I think there is a problem that um, a lot of us have been avoiding, and we need to talk about it. And uh, the problem is capitalism, and uh, you know, I'm from Armenia, a small country. Again, like not a lot of geopolitical power is vested in um, in the citizens of my country and in the residents of my country. But I do want to say that anti-war activism and peace activism uh, cannot succeed, succeed or even exist in a vacuum because um, as Oksana mentioned, this is uh, the war in uh, Palestine and Israel started just today and it's the third major war in uh, just probably the in the in the past four years, that is insane. And uh, we need to understand that a lot of the militarism and a lot of these wars are started um, because of um, empires and corporations and capitalist powers trying to um, accumulate more and more power. And that includes financial and economic power as well, not just political power. Um, I don't want uh, uh, this speech kind of to be wishy-washy, but I do want to say that um, uh, since there are a lot of people and a lot of activists who I have a lot of respect for um, in, this, uh, in this webinar from uh, countries that do have a lot of political power, um, I want to say that peace activism and anti-war activism um, need to uh, be connected uh, to other forms of activism and most specifically anti-capitalism and uh, anti-capitalist uh, sentiments in the country, in, in, in their countries. Um, otherwise, uh, just... Uh, Otherwise, uh, otherwise, it just becomes a lot of like wishy-washy sentiment, and uh, we need more anti-war. Uh, we need anti-war activism um, be, to be intersectional. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I don't know if anyone have an uh, answer to the question from Sean Connor concerning indigenous people in Russia. You have Yuri. Uh, well, uh, yes. Um... Uh, I, I would say uh, that um, uh, uh, it is important question uh, to uh, achieve um, uh, harmonious relation uh, uh, in societies uh, uh, between people of uh, uh, different ethnic origins and, um, uh, uh, of course, uh, 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 Putin's regime uh, exploits uh, national minorities, uh, uh, tries to assimilate them, uh, uh, though uh, uh, 
comparing uh, uh, politics of uh, uh, ethno nationalism uh, in Russia and in Ukraine. In Ukraine, we also uh, have uh, uh, explicitly ethno nationalistic and sometimes very harsh policies. Uh, I would like to add uh, uh, to uh, uh, Sean's uh, uh, important point regarding. Uh, uh, preserving rights of national minorities in Russia that uh, as uh, all human rights issues we should not allow to weaponize uh, this human right issue because there are some circles uh, which are uh, seeking uh, uh, to use uh, national minorities in Russia as a weapon uh, of destruction uh, not only of Putin regime but of Russian state uh, probably of dismembering Russia uh, uh, to uh, reduce uh, Russian threat and challenge to uh, um, United States dominated world order uh, and uh, uh, this uh, uh, weaponization of human rights uh, as well as any weaponization of human rights uh, uh, there are indeed some people who also trying to weaponize even dear to my heart right to refuse to kill uh, any weaponization of human rights uh, are inappropriate and we, we should be uh, ethically consistent uh, in our nonviolent resistance to resist war, not to resist fictional enemy, to defend human rights, not to resist uh, militant people pretending to be right, you know, uh, and uh, um, uh, uh, talking about uh, um, Alexei's point, um, uh, uh, example of, of his friend uh, is uh, 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 in fact example uh, why uh, uh, trust to war, trust to army uh, uh, lead uh, to moral failure. Uh, uh, because uh, uh, his his friend, my my condolences, uh, of course, uh, tried to use a war as a vehicle uh, for social change, and uh, of course, it it was not a realistic idea. And uh, uh, yes, war, war kills. So unfortunately, a, a, a price for these delusions was high. Uh, uh, but human right defense by nonviolent means it itself uh, ethically consistent uh, uh, to uh, um, uh, develop uh, uh, human dignity, not to develop some sort of violent sovereignty. Uh, this is uh, important. Human rights defense is morally strong uh, political position, as I wrote in chat. And uh, as I said, right to refuse to kill uh, uh, comes first, because it is a first step to de-escalation in the escalation ladder. Uh, also, there is a right to refuse to lie, a refuse to hate, because every war is based on lies. So, uh, uh, freedom to Boris Kogarlitsky, to all truth tellers, uh, asylum to Olga Karic, to all conscientious objectors and deserters. I invite you uh, to website of Object War Campaign, support Object War Campaign, uh, objectwarcampaign.org and uh, peace to Ukraine and whole the planet, and to peace activists in Ukraine and everywhere. Thank you, Yuri. Ox uh, Igor. Uh, microphone, please. Mm -hmm. I agree with Yuri his reply to Sean's question uh, that uh, the weaponization of this ethnic uh, minorities problem is itself a problem. Actually, uh, I think that uh, the main victim of this militarization is Russia, uh, are not uh, specifically one or another ethnic minority, but poor people, because poor people are uh, preferably recruited to the army now. Uh, and the last point, uh, separate point, I would uh, like to make as this di is discussion about the political repression against the anti-war activists. Yes, uh, they uh, must be defended in all countries, including Russia, including Ukraine. And uh, as of now, I would specifically add 
at one country more uh, in connection with the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. This is Azerbaijan because uh, there is uh, repression more serious than before against uh, anti-war and political opposition activists in Azerbaijan. I think it is not well known in the West too and uh, more attention to it also should be paid. Thank you very much to all, and of course, especially to Yuri, Alexei, and Oksana. It is a really wonder how Russian exiles like Alexei and Oksana are especially repressed. This was very much the case in Sweden, where Alexei still this year was attacked by in several sort of uh, people because he was supposed to be participate at People in Peace, who is um, very many of these, uh, this webinar we have are coming from this People in Peace network in, in Sweden. And Oksana in her very <clears throat> non-biased way of approaching these issues, including in Latvia and Estonia, where the Swedish diplomats paved the way for the discrimination of the Russian minority by destroying their rights to <coughs> citizenship uh, with strong diplomatic means, which is a very open thing in Sweden. You can find um, information about it, but it's uh, never addressed by the peace movement and others. So uh, I would say that there is also a question of repression everywhere. We see it against women for peace in Sweden now. Uh, and uh, we have to see that this is a common pro uh, problem. Uh, of course, I agree with uh, those like Igor saying that we have to deepen our thing and getting more focused, but we simultaneously don't need only small steps. Like Boris Kagalitsky says very consistently, we need also big steps. And I think that the case of Boris Kagalitsky is interesting because he's not only opposing Russian oligarchs, he's also opposing the Western oligarchs. And I would say that the left has bigger problems than the environmental movement because we address the development model everywhere. With other words, we, 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 uh, are not locked into being against Russian or US imperialists. We want to defend another development model for humanity. So we be move small steps and big steps. We see each other again at 14. I wish you a good lunch and thank you very much for your participation. And I hope to see as many as possible then and that we can make this webinar a good step forward in both small and big regards to words, World Social Forum in Nepal in February 2024.